It's been a busy, busy day. And I have to hand it to the folk here for their enthusiasm, their patience, and their unfailing good humor. So, from Ottawa, and from our first Canadian roadshow, goodbye. Next week, the roadshow's back on British soil at Winston Churchill's former home, Chartwell. Coming up tonight, the future is closer than you think. Board the time machine in 25 minutes after the news. Do you ever wish you could get a bit more choice from your telly? Well, there are now six new BBC channels you can get for free. All you need is the right kit. Basically, there are three ways to go. Cable, satellite, and now there's a new way, free view. You'll need a small box like this one. You just plug it into the back of your TV, and away you go. You'll get around 30 channels, including the six new ones from the BBC. Get the latest in documentaries and the best of world cinema on BBC4. Keep up with news and current affairs any time of the day with BBC News 24. Three BBC Three, the home of cutting-edge comedy, drama and documentaries. And of course, there's the CBBC channel and CBBS for the little ones. With Freeview, there is no monthly subscription. You just buy the box for a one-off cost of around fifty pounds. To know more about how to get these six extra BBC channels on cable, satellite services, and Freeview, just call 08700 101010 and we'll send you a free guide. Now on BBC One, the news with Jane Hill. The Sudan crisis, the BBC hears first-hand accounts of the violence. Refugees allege government forces have aided the militias. A series of bombs in Iraq target Christian churches for the first time. Staff shortages in some hospitals as junior doctors' hours are cut. And pressure mounts on the FA over its handling of the Sven affair. Hello, good evening. The Sudanese government has tonight condemned a United Nations deadline which gives it 30 days to start disarming the Arab militias blamed for the humanitarian crisis in the Darfur region. But many refugees have told the BBC that Sudanese forces have been actively helping the very armed gangs they've pledged to crack down on, a claim that the Sudanese government denies. The militias, known as the Janjaweed, are said by the UN to have killed 30,000 people and forced more than a million from their homes. Thousands of people have fled across the border to neighbouring Chad. From close to the border, our correspondent Nicholas Witchell reports. Dawn on a frontier which looks across into something Africa had hoped it would never witness again. On the far side of the dried out riverbed lies a Sudanese village. It is deserted. Its people have fled from what some are calling genocide. Nearby on the Chad side of the border are some of the many thousands who've sought refuge from Sudan. Many have gone to the camps run by the relief agencies, but others prefer to remain in makeshift homes made from bits of rubbish. Most of the refugees are women, and the stories they tell are of murder and brutality, of husbands and sons who are dead, of homes which were burned, and of other things which they are too embarrassed to describe. They killed our men and they did bad things to women. I cannot explain, this girl told us, because it is so much shame. Seven women and children live in this one tiny room. They have very little food, indeed they have very little of anything. Ask them who did this and they speak quietly about the gingerweed, the Arab militia. But it wasn't only them. They all speak of the involvement of Sudanese government forces. 
and government and after that also the bombing of the plane after the plane the Nyanyu come again and she's absolutely certain that Sudanese government forces were involved yes in, in, in Sudan for example all these things happen in Sudan from each of the family groups we spoke to essentially the same story uh, women described how the attack started with Sudanese government aircraft and then the Arab militia arrived on horseback. Sometimes the women said government forces and militia worked together. Nearly 200,000 people have fled from the killings in Sudan, but recently the exodus has virtually stopped. The relief agencies believe the Sudanese authorities may now be preventing people from leaving. It all adds to the rising sense of alarm. On the other hand, if indeed this absence is because uh, they are being killed or because they are being forcibly prevented from crossing over, that means that their lives are in danger and this is, would be of concern to us. Uh, in Do you think that might be the case? I think it might be the case, yes. We simply don't know what's happening across this border inside Sudan. Whether it is ethnic cleansing or even genocide is a matter of definition. But this much is certain. People we've met here in Tine and at refugee camps elsewhere speak with a great consistency about a campaign of terror waged against them. A campaign of terror waged, they say, not just by the Arab militia, but also, they say, by the forces of the Sudanese government. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News, on the border between Chad and Sudan. Bombs have exploded outside five churches across Iraq, killing at least two people and injuring dozens more. The attacks happened in the capital Baghdad and in the northern city of Mosul. It's the first time the Christian community in Iraq has faced such direct attacks. Our correspondent Caroline Hawley is in Baghdad tonight for us. Caroline. Well, as you can imagine, this is a huge shock to Iraqi Christians who make up about 3% of the population here. Now, people have told us how they had to dive in terror under church pews to try to protect themselves as glass blew in on them. A terrifying experience. And it is, as you say, the first attacks there have been on churches here. Evening mass was being held at many of Iraq's churches when the bombings began. This Armenian church in central Baghdad was the first to be hit. The explosives carried in a car. There were dozens of people praying inside at the time, and this just the start of what appears to have been a carefully coordinated series of attacks. Crowds gathered to watch in horror. Nervous police tried to keep them back and out of danger. But even before the fires had been put out here, a second explosion. This was the Assyrian church. The Christians are a minority of around 800,000 people who've lived in peace with the Muslim majority here for generations. Many see this as an attempt to ignite sectarian strife. I think it is another step down uh, for the people that are doing this. I mean, the people that were, were injured and the people that were, and I'm sure, there will be I'm sure there will be killed before this is all said and done. Uh, but, but these people were doing nothing but just going about their daily lives. And they were, they were in the church for prayer. In the northern town of Mosul, meanwhile, two more bombs targeting yet another church. In recent weeks, Christians have been feeling the pressure. There have been a string of bombings of alcohol shops, which are mostly Christian owned. But no one could have imagined this. They were innocent people, innocent, this man says. Does God want this? In a conflict, no one knows how to stop. No one knows who the next target will be. Well, I've just come back from the scene of two of the bomb attacks and police there say there was a third bomb that didn't go off. So I think it is lucky that the toll wasn't even higher. Having said that, it, it's certain that this does mark a new low in uh, the campaign of violence here. Caroline, thank you. The United States government has tonight put financial institutions on high alert after new intelligence suggested a security threat. The announcement was made within the last half an hour by the head of Homeland Security, Tom Ridge. He said he'd received specific intelligence that al-Qaeda was planning attacks against a number of buildings in Washington and New York. Reports indicate that al-Qaeda is targeting several specific buildings including the International Monetary Fund and World Bank in the District of Columbia, Prudential Financial in northern New Jersey, 
in Citigroup buildings and the New York Stock Exchange in New York. Let me assure you, let me reassure you, actions to further strengthen security around these buildings are already underway. Well, that was Tom Ridge. Let's get more from our correspondent, Daniel Lack, who's in Washington. Uh, Daniel, this has only happened in the last half an hour or so. What more can you tell us? Well, Tom Ridge was pretty quick to go on the air and, and release this alert. People in New York this morning woke up to the unusual sight of dozens of police cars and heavily armed police officers on Wall Street, the financial district, patrolling back and forth. This information has come out just in the past 24 hours and hardened in the past hour or so. And, and Mr. Ridge says the buildings that they know are, are very specific. The methods, car and truck bombs they know are very specific. They have no specific ideas about time, but they think it could be fairly soon, at least sometime in the next few weeks. So they're very worried and they've had to raise the alert level and issue this warning. Uh, this, of course, though, by no means the first time they've, they've had to raise the level, they've had this kind of alert, but there does seem a, a new intensity about this tonight. There does, and uh, Mr. Ridge's words were that the information was unusually specific, not just the usual intelligence chatter that they pick up, background noise, communication between terrorist groups or suspected terrorists. This time they heard buildings, they heard methods, they heard it was Al-Qaeda, they heard timelines. They say they're quite sure that this is authentic, this is worth acting upon, worth inconveniencing many people who will be using some of these buildings in the coming weeks. So it's going to be very tense, but Mr. Ridge says the fact that they have the information means they'll be able to prevent anything. All right, Daniel Lack, thanks very much. Here, new laws which limit the number of hours that junior doctors can work came into force today. Under European regulations, doctors in training won't be allowed to work more than 58 hours a week, as Richard Lister reports. For David Macklin, a junior doctor in Liverpool, working 60 or 70 hours a week is part of the job. But that's bad for him, he says, and bad for patients too. You wouldn't want to be in a plane uh, flown by a pilot uh, who hadn't slept for two days. Why would you want to be looked after by a doctor who had, hadn't slept for a similar period of time? So the working time directive is crucial for patient safety and also the improvement of doctors' working lives. For most of us, the working week is already limited to 48 hours under the European Working Time Directive, passed six years ago. But for junior doctors, the limit is being phased in, with a maximum 58-hour week from today down to 48 hours by 2009. But the health service says that at one in six hospital trusts, some junior doctors will still be working beyond the legal limit. That's because managers haven't been able to find enough new staff to fill in the gaps. The directive came into force in 1998, so the idea that here we are today on the 1st of August with trusts still not ready simply shows a lack of proper planning. There aren't going to be problems across whole hospitals. They're more likely to occur in certain specific specialities where there is need for complex 24-hour sort of care, such as neonatal and paediatric care. But if junior doctors spend fewer hours in hospital, they get less time with patients. Practicing on computerized models like this one may help, but some senior doctors are worried that the trainees now coming through the system may not get all the experience they need. Richard Lister, BBC News. There's been more pressure today on the Football Association over its handling of an alleged relationship between Sven Joran Eriksson and an FA secretary. The News of the World claims that the FA's Director of Communications, Colin Gibson, suggested a deal to try to ensure that allegations about the Association's chief executive, Mark Palios, were not published. James Munro has the story. Once again, Sven Joran Eriksson's private life has become a story for the Sunday papers. But this time, it's his colleagues at the Football Association who are under scrutiny, including this man, Colin Gibson, the FA's Director of Communications. The News of the World has published what it claims is a transcript of a conversation in which he offered to provide them with information about the England coach's relationship with a secretary at the FA, Faria Alam, on one condition that they didn't mention her relationship with Mark Palios, the FA's chief executive. He's now under pressure to clarify whether he knew about this alleged deal. Sven Jorn Eriksson won't comment, but his agent spoke to the BBC. I spoke to Sven uh, when last night. He absolutely did not want to comment because, you know, in reading this one can see that potentially people's jobs are on the line. It's not a nice situation at all. 
The Football Association is already carrying out an investigation into why their lawyers initially denied reports of any relationship involving Sven Joran Eriksson. They then had to withdraw that statement. Colin Gibson hasn't confirmed or denied whether the transcript is genuine, but he issued a statement saying, Last week I complied with the FA inquiry, gave them complete details of the events. The FA knew about the details last week and the story about brokering a deal. That inquiry is due to be completed by Thursday when the FA's main board will meet here to discuss its findings and to decide whether any senior officials did mislead them. But this will only increase the pressure on some of the biggest names in English football to explain their roles in this story. James Munro, BBC News, Central London. Schools are to be offered the use of scanning machines to detect pupils carrying knives. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner Sir John Stevens says head teachers in London will be allowed to use the mobile equipment and the scheme could be extended to cover the rest of the UK. For many US students, the reality of school life already includes being scanned for concealed weapons. In Britain, the conviction of 16-year-old Alan Pennell for stabbing to death 14-year-old fellow pupil Luke Wormsley has once again focused public opinion on school security, particularly the carrying of knives. Now, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner is offering head teachers sophisticated mobile X-ray scanning machines to stop further deaths. The machines have already been used to detect a number of guns and other weapons during raids in East London in April. In a newspaper interview, Sir John Stevens said, We would use them in any place the headmaster felt there was a problem with knives. We would also work with the headmaster in hot spots outside schools, places where we know knives are carried. Initially, it'll be schools in London that are offered the option of using the police scanners if it's felt there's a need for them. Access or security, it'll always be a difficult balance for teachers. But it seems technology normally used to fight terrorism and drugs could soon be coming to the school gates. The benefits of CCTV are well established. Head teachers welcome the idea of scanners. I think scanners would help to highlight to children this is a very serious problem. This is a deterrent that may be used, you may be found out, and if you are found out, the results will be, the consequences will be very serious. While knife injuries among school children have risen, fatalities from stabbings remain rare. Clarence Mitchell, BBC News. Members of the World Trade Organization have reached a draft agreement on reducing barriers to international trade. After talks in Geneva, the WTO approved a plan to reduce the subsidies paid to farmers in rich countries. It's hoped the deal will eventually narrow the trade gap between developed and developing nations. Now, England's cricketers have won the second test at Edgbaston to go two up in the four-match series. They beat the West Indies by 256 runs. It's England's eighth win in their last nine tests. The Freddie Flintoff factor. They were queuing in their thousands for the chance to see England's explosive all-rounder bat for a second time. But first they had to stand and salute Marcus Treskovic's second hundred of the match as resurgent England tightened their grip on the game and the series. He was run out soon after, narrowly beaten Surely by Sarwan's direct. direct hit. And so keen was Flintoff to get cracking, the arrivals and departure lounges became the same place. Typically, he announced himself in magisterial manner. He's got a lot of height on it. But this time it didn't last. Distance. After making 20, he again got the height, but not the distance. Won't get away with this. Yes, the sense of disappointment spread to his teammates, and England were dismissed for 248. That still left West Indies with a mountainous task even to save the game, and they never got out of the foothills after their rock, Brian Lara, was rolled aside by a poor umpiring decision. What followed was a pitiful procession to shame the great tradition of Caribbean cricket, with Ashley Giles again the chief beneficiary. Inside four days, England had their eighth win in the last nine tests. Winning's the key to everything. If you win games of cricket from positions that we have been in the last year, um, and come through the other side, it, it gives you extra belief and that's all that's happening at the minute. Wins against West Indies may not be the most reliable barometer of quality, but England at last do seem to have a team of real substance. Kevin Geary, BBC News. That's it for now. There's more here on BBC One at 10 o'clock. Now it's time to join our news teams across the UK.
A man's been arrested after a policeman was stabbed in Cumbria. The officer was investigating a break-in at a house on McAdam Way in Penrith just before one this morning when it happened. He managed to get out of the house and call for help. Nearly 20 officers in full riot gear surrounded the house for three hours. A 47-year-old man was arrested and is still being questioned. Northumbria police have praised the behaviour of football fans following yesterday's Newcastle Gateshead Cup match. There was a visible police presence in both Newcastle City Centre and Whitley Bay all evening. Thousands of supporters from some of Europe's biggest clubs had travelled here to watch their team's friendly match at St James's Park. There were worries about potential trouble, but police say they were pleased with the behaviour of fans. Staying with football and Newcastle United manager Sir Bobby Robson looks like joining skipper Alan Shearer in retirement at the end of the season. Reports over the weekend say club chairman Freddie Shepherd has confirmed this will be Robson's last year in charge at St James's Park. And there was more disappointment for the Magpies boss this afternoon when United lost in the final of their own pre-season tournament. This girl from Chilean international Rodrigo Tolea saw the black and whites go down 1-0 to the Portuguese side Sporting Lisbon. New signing Patrick Clivert made his first appearance on Townside since moving from Barcelona. The Dutch striker came on for the last half hour but couldn't help Newcastle find an equaliser. Meanwhile, Sunderland came from behind at Doncaster Rovers to win their last season pre-season friendly by three goals to one. It's the oldest organised sport in the world, even older than the Olympic Games, which incidentally it's not included in. And this weekend, the European Championships have been held in Stockton. It's dragon boat racing, and a thousand competitors from eight countries have been competing in more than 50 races. Keith Akehurst. Reports. Go! To the beat of a drum, the dragon boats race down a 500 metre course on the River Tees at Stockton, among the top men and women in their sport. They've come from as far away as Vladivostok in Russia, and they've brought supporters as well to cheer them on. It's a prestigious event that's only been held in Britain once before, and until now, never in the north. We had to bid in, the Italians had it last year, they wanted it again this year, it's going to Germany next year, but we bid for it. We were inspected back in uh, January of this year by a Swiss delegation who came over to inspect the facilities, they were delighted, and so it was uh, all systems go from January to get the event ready. There are 22 in each boat, 20 paddlers, a helmsman and a drummer. It appeals as much to men as to women who can compete on an equal footing. In most races, men and women compete in the same boat, although there are single-sex competitions as well as junior and seniors events. And anyone can jump in a dragon boat and within 10 minutes can be an expert and can paddle one. That's, that's the easy bit. If you want to become serious about it, then like any sport, it takes a lot of training, dedication, teamwork and, and technique. The design of the boat is completely different to a canoe, it's a different size, it has a drummer and a helm. The similarity is that it's a paddled watercraft, the same as a canoe, but it's technically uh, not a canoe. It's the third big event Stockton has had at the Barrage in recent years. The council hopes it'll help in its bid to become a training base for rowing teams if the Olympics come to London in 2012. Now, let's take a look at the weather. Tonight, mainly dry with extensive mist and some fog patches over the hills, a low of 11 Celsius, 52 Fahrenheit. Tomorrow, early cloud and mist, slowly clearing, giving sunny spells by midday, a high of 20 Celsius, 68 Fahrenheit. The sunburn risk and pollen level medium. Looking ahead, Tuesday, cloudy or overcast with a risk of thundery showers. Wednesday, cloudy with some mist. Thursday, rather dull and damp and Friday dry with sunny spells. And that's it from the weekend team. The next bulletin will be at half past six tomorrow morning here on BBC One. Till then, enjoy the rest of the weekend. How easy it is to watch almost all your favourite BBC programmes with subtitles. From award-winning drama and comedy to films, sports coverage and the local and national news. You can find subtitles for all sorts of programmes on CFAX page 888. Or if you're a digital viewer, simply select subtitles from the menu. Log on to bbc.co.uk slash info for more details.
Good evening, it's been a sunny Sunday afternoon, virtually nationwide. Under blue skies, we've been basking in temperatures of the mid to high 20s. But once again, just like yesterday, spare a thought for those on the northeastern coast of England, eastern Scotland, under low cloud. We really struggle, just 15 or 16 degrees here. Could be a similar problem again tomorrow. But for the rest of us, a change in the weather, increasing humidity, increasing risk of thunderstorms as we go towards the middle of the week. Very localised, some people staying dry, other people seeing an absolute deluge. First signs of those thunderstorms not far off the coast of Cornwall right now, and southwestern parts of England will be prone to some thundery rain later on tonight. That mist and murk creeping in again off the North Sea to affect eastern Scotland, many central and eastern parts of England in between fine, but a sticky old night out there. Temperatures hovering in the mid-teens, no lower than 17 or 18 across some southern parts of England. Three-way split tomorrow morning, those thundery showers pushing up from the southwest to affect parts of South Wales, knocking on the door of Northern Ireland too. Very grey and murky across many eastern parts of the UK, but in between some sunshine, albeit rather hazy. Now through the afternoon those thundery showers will creep northeastwards to affect other parts of Northern Ireland, Wales, through the Midlands, towards the southeast. Again locally some torrential downpours in between those, some spells of hazy sunshine and many places will remain dry. Once more, pretty misty near that northeastern coast, cool here, 16 or 17, very humid elsewhere, as high as 28 degrees in parts of the south. Thunderstorms spreading to many places as you go through Tuesday. Every second counts, next here on BBC One, in the time machine. Starts 13th of August on BBC TV, radio and interactive. Legends will be rewritten. This is the 38 discovered in the victim's hand. One body, five minds. Suicide. Or not. That's the question. He did not shoot himself. Unless he was a contortionist. The bullet is a match for two unsolved fatal unsolved. shootings. One team, one solution. Waking the dead after Time Machine on BBC One. So now on BBC One, here's an idea. Imagine if you could halt the constant march of time. <laughs> 